Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick. We're here at Telecom T's very own event, which is the DSP Leaders Forum 2019. And I'm talking with an old pal and now a CEO, Andrew Coward, CEO of Lumina Networks. So how has your role and Lumina's role um, in the industry helped you to put you in a position to be able to support the transformation that you're talking about? And tell us a bit about how this led to your new 5G ebook. Mm. Well, we're, we're in a very privileged position um, because from an open source perspective, we get to work with everybody, uh, meaning that um, our customers, uh, so people like AT&T, Verizon, who both our customers actually invested in Lumina as well, um, their whole aim is to make sure that all vendors work in this ecosystem, whether they want to or not. <laughs> So we, we have kind of two types of vendors in this in, in the ecosystem. The, the vendors that naturally want to be in, in, working with open source because it helps propel their products into the network, and others perhaps who own that network infrastructure who see this as a threat and a challenge and would rather not because they think they can control the entire network by themselves, and that's very much what would happen. Um, so they get told that they have to work together to make that to make that happen. Now, as it relates to 5G and, and what we've spent a lot of time and effort thinking through is, is how do you put all this process of automation um, and, and, and bring open source into, into the 5G network to, to basically form and make sure this transformation happens so you can actually deliver these new services. So we put a, a, a small book together um, around 5G just to really talk through how do you actually do that and how does it get done? Right, now in that book, because I know about it as well, you know. Um, it, you focus on five overlooked factors which you say can make or break a 5G strategy. Let's talk those through. The first factor I know is the physical network matters. To f the, f the physical network matters to 5G deployments. 5G often focuses on what's new and with bandwidth and radio and so on. Why are you arguing physical will play such an important role? Well, physical plays a really important role because it's already there um, and it's going to get used. Um, and so really what, what you need to be able to do is take advantage of that physical network infrastructure, whether it's backhaul, whether it's microwave, um, whether it's the existing MPLS network, and co-opt it into delivering these new services. And what we're really doing essentially is bringing agility to that existing network by enabling it to be dynamically managed and configured um, by applications, by services, by whatever needs that, that bandwidth at whatever point in time. Okay, second factor which you highlight is orchestration. We've touched on that. Um, tell us a bit more about it, why it is in the place it is, and not more than that, why you consider it to be an overlooked factor when it's surely central to the whole working of 5G in the first place. Well, yes, so orchestration uh, is important because or overlooked, if you like, to the extent that people think of orchestration today in silos. Yeah. So I'm going to orchestrate the optical infrastructure, and then I'm going to orchestrate the MPLS network, and then I'm going to orchestrate the radio part of it. And that's all different groups and all different people. You can't deploy 5G services in that manner because they have to be turned on instantly, and they have to move around the network dynamically depending on load and, and latency requirements and so on. So orchestration holistically across all of these different domains is the outcome required to deliver uh, a new 5G core. Third one, which is a bit different, this overlook factor, intent. Well, surely if you're building a 5G network, you have an intention to build it, no matter what. Um, it's, but what is the capability which you call intent, and why is it actually so instrumental in a 5G network? Well. Uh, in, Intent-based networks, um, which the industry again is talking about in kind of pretty hyped terms at the moment, um, in a 5G world really means giving control of the network to applications, um, to, the, to the data center, to things that need um, network resources that don't really understand what it means to deliver that. So for example, I need um, bandwidth f you know, from my application all the way to this base station. I need a certain amount of bandwidth, I need a certain amount of latency. Yep. I don't know or care how that gets delivered, but I'm going to use an API call and say, give me this give me this bandwidth, give me this connection. And I'll get a response back to say, yes, I've done it, or no, it can't be done, in which case I may take some other actions. So that's intent-based networking. Right. It's fundamental. Um, again, it needs to be orchestrated across all of these different components. The second part of intent, 
database networking, uh, which is again overlooked, is the fact that you have to pull information out of things to find out um, whether they're successful or not, whether they're broken, whether they're failing, or whether they've got issues. And you then use that information to make decisions about what you want to do about it in real time. So if a backhaul link goes down, you now know about it immediately, and you're making a business decision about how to react to that. Do you move users onto a different cell tower? Do you try and use microwave backup? Do you, what do you do in that instance? And, and have that happen immediately. This then plays into things like network security as well. So when you see an attack happen across the network or on, on infrastructure, how do you react to that and so on? It also, by the way, is a huge enabler of um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Because if you, if you don't have this information in real time, you can't make decisions about what to do. <laughs> and, and so the machine learning elements that then come to play will, will use this information to, to make uh, what we assume to be intelligent decisions about what to do. Right, that makes good sense. Um, the fourth factor is open source. Now you've already, you've already talked about open source, and um, there's no there's no surprise that you, you, from the Lumina perspective that you, you're into it. Yeah, just quickly review, just to reiterate and recap, why is open source on the list? If it's you know why do you consider it? And it seems that you talk about it so much. Why do you think it's overlooked? Well, it, open source can be overlooked from, in a network perspective because people think about using vendors to go solve problems. It's kind of an obvious statement to make, but when that, when that happens and those vendors pro provide proprietary solutions, it's very hard for that proprietary vendor with a proprietary solution to make that work with lots of other different vendors who are competing against them. Yeah. So the role that open source plays, and by extension the role that we play as Lumina, is a kind of Switzerland in this, um, <laughs> meaning that uh, we, we're working with any and everybody in this environment. Um, and, and from a customer perspective, because we're bringing open source to, to, um, into productization with this, if we were to go away tomorrow, we get snapped up by somebody who, who our customers don't like, they can always go back to the open source and the open community version of it. And so for us as Lumina, we can, we can only be as, be, be, provide the extra services on top of that. We're, we're never taking away from the, the value that the community has delivered in, in bringing open daylight to market. Uh, and that makes this huge difference. And, and that's the deciding factor in how you actually bring holistically together this entire network. Last one, which again is a make or break factor and an overlooked one, is culture. Now, you and I have talked about this before and the, the industry is predicated for the change on, yes, we've got, we have a culture, we have to change it. But again, as we've said before, it's, they've been working on shifting telco cultures for quite a long time. Does 5G influence culture and cultural change, or is it just yet another thing that, that lets, no names, no pack drill, but that some telcos, organizations, and CSPs try to, try to change and to manage, but find it's impossible because of the sheer inertia of the entire organization? Right, well, so 5G um, is forcing cultural change, essentially, because um, the IT group have to work with the networking group. The optical group have to work with the MPLS group. And so from that perspective, it, it's bringing these companies together. And we've heard at this, this conference this week, you know, from some of the telcos on how they're doing that and what that looks like. Um, so from our perspective, however, it isn't just that they're working together. They, they now have to take on working in different ways. Um, so, for example, bringing DevOps to bear across an organization, having continuous integration test cycles for what the network looks like. Um, and, and we see our customers going through this journey. And we also see them occasionally trip up as well as they go through the transformation. And then they, they kind of reorganize and figure out what went wrong and, and fix it. And so, from, from our perspective, and, and as we bring our solutions into our customers, we, we set the CICD process up with our customers. We, we work through agile methods with our customers. And so if, if, if they don't already have those teams, and many of them do, but when they don't, we, we kind of bring that culture to say, look, this is how we can get this done with open source. And, and that then um, it kind of infects the rest of the organization, if you like, through, through that whole process. Good stuff. Andrew Coward, as usual, thanks very much. Thank you, Martin. It's been great.